Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining Options Based Tools to Navigate 2021 webinar hosted by NASDAQ. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ and your host for this afternoon's session. Today, we are joined by a robust panel of financial experts highlighting various ETFs and options based tools that advisors can easily utilize to differentiate themselves from the competition. We'll be covering a range of derivative strategies and various fund structures with a specific emphasis on the ETF ecosystem. And our panelists will also demonstrate how you can strategically deploy options in your client portfolios. This afternoon, we're joined by Joe Cusick, Vice President and Portfolio Specialist with Calamos Investments, James McDonald, CEO of Hercules Investments, and finally, Paul Kim, CEO of Simplify. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Let's get right into the content here. First, we'll start with Paul. How are you thinking about utilizing index options to protect gains from 2020 while still participating on continued momentum? And I'd encourage all the panelists to voice their opinions here. Sure. So our five ETFs that we have, including two that we just launched on NASDAQ, essentially provide beta exposure with a, a little bit of tail insurance. So we think of options more as catastrophic insurance, more than tactical or strategic plays. We're just trying to essentially take advantage of extreme markets when they happen. We're not trying to predict if or uh, how often they happen. We're just trying to keep structural tail insurance on. All right, and James, if you could follow up as well. Uh, that's a brilliant strategy what Paul's doing. And you know, to his point, uh, you know, options have explosive upside uh, when triggered. And I think it's a great approach um, to build an asset allocation plan, but then have protection and uh, those funds QQD and QQC are, are going to do that on both the upside and the downside. Uh, where we specialize is identifying those moments where that explosiveness can happen. And, in any portfolio strategy, you need both approaches, right? You need a long approach, you need a short approach, and then a what if um, tactical strategy. And our focus is that what if. And that what if occurs on indexes many times a day, many times a week uh, in trend reversals. And we buy options in anticipation of these trend reversals where the psychology shifts from fear to greed or from greed to fear um, and seek to generate outperformance that way. Uh, and we do this with a laser focus. This is our specialization is monetizing volatility out of these indexes and options can do so many things. And we like to participate in the options uh, just before they explode. And so we are a timing based model and extremely focused on that what if situation, not in the big picture and not in the big catastrophic events, but in those little reversals that happen all day long. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump in. You know, from from our perspective, as as James said, and and I think Paul as well, you have to have first of all be active uh, when you're doing it. Here uh, at Calmos, we basically focus uh, on hedging out consistently. We have a process. We always have guardrails of how much protection we have on, um, and we harvest when we when we can, um, not based on a you know a timing mechanism or whatnot. Um, that's important because not all strategies work in all volatility regimes, all business cycles. And so you have to actively manage the, the option strategies that you're deploying. And like I said, the most important thing is to have a real strong process. And then the second most important thing is, is that you have guardrails. Always have consistency in your approach. And of course, James, the million dollar question is, now that the election is passed and vaccine approval has been granted, what are the known and unknown macro risks associated with today's market that may slow the upward trend in 2021? Because as it appears right now, you know, stocks continue to move to the upper right of the chart. Right. There's so many different risks. And, uh, you know, back in the old days, we called a, a factor based investing and looking at risk factors. And when we think about risk factors, we really think of broadly uh, where are the things that can shift momentum quickly? And obviously COVID is the biggest risk, you know, manufacturing and distributing a vaccine on this scale in such a short time frame has never been done before. And it presents unique challenges. And the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at negative 70 degrees, Moderna at negative 20 degrees and shipping companies, UPS, FedEx are already having trouble meeting the increased demand for online shopping. So shipping a vaccine in such large quantities will almost certainly result 
in some delays. And those delays are going to trickle down uh, into the reopening process and they're going to trickle down into the infection rate and so on and so forth. And so those are the big factors with COVID right now is the efficacy of delivering the vaccine. And then in terms of the second big set of factors, we really look at the economy and where it's struggling and the renewed lockdowns, they threaten the recent marginal process we've had. We just saw today, weekless jobless claims came in at 885,000. It's the highest reading since September. And so that metric is going in the wrong direction. We see mass layoffs expected to continue into 2021. Disney plans to lay off 32,000 people by March. State Street's gonna break its no layoff pledge in 2021. Southwest is planning layoffs. IBM is planning layoffs. Uh, there's a Houston-based major employer, Sable Perlman. It went bankrupt and it's gonna fire all its employees. And then November retail sales uh, looking uh, 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 at the momentum going into 2021, they surprised to the downside. And so these are the type of things that we think about um, when we figure out where the risk is coming from, both the COVID related, uh, excuse me, COVID related with the vaccine and then uh, the macroeconomic situation. We think that, you know, it's impossible to avoid uh, a, a, a major uh, a disruption of our economic process if this vaccine isn't delivered. And then obviously the effects from March um, up until the vaccine was delivered uh, or created, uh, you know, are still going to start trickling in. We haven't seen, uh, we think, the true impact of the virus. Right, Paul, and if you can follow up, because James makes an excellent point, the data is catching up to reality because, of course, you know, data is a, is a backward-looking um, um, mechanism. So, you know, I, I would agree with the risk there that James had mentioned. Yeah, so two things that sort of are interesting for us is uh, I think COVID's really accelerated long-term trends, right? So figuring out what's sort of a permanent long-term trend, i.e. things like the embracing of technology, working from home, flexibility, things like that versus what's a temporary, you know, short-term change and, and figuring out who the sort of the long-term permanent winners and losers out of this sort of, uh, you know, dislocation we had um, is going to be an important thing to figure out going forward. The second big macro risk is inflation. We really haven't really thought much about inflation for the past 12 years. And in most markets internationally, uh, central banks have struggled to just generate any inflation, but we're finally seeing fiscal stimulus and giving essentially money directly to people, right? And that's definitely triggering in the data much more signs of inflation, whether it's in industrial metals, it's, you know, other commodities, certainly, uh, you know, anything you could think of in terms of your traditional measures of inflation, break-evens, all are going up. And so figuring out is that a trend and how much longer can that run? And is fiscal policies finally the, the, the thing that breaks, you know, the sort of inability to generate inflation and how much inflation can we see? And we're seeing fiat currency weakness across the board. And we're seeing Bitcoin and other sort of anti-fiat uh, investments going up. And so again, how much further does that have to go in uh, how to sort of anticipate and prepare your portfolios? Certainly things like nominal bonds inside portfolios when you're seeing potential inflation is a very, very risky exposure. And so we're constantly thinking about those two things, what we know and what we don't know, and frankly, just watching the data to see what we can figure out. Right, Joe, and to, and to Paul's point, this is going to have to unwind itself at some point. Um, I know we've been saying that for a, a couple of years, but a lot of assets are inflated. Uh, yeah, but you got to be careful about that. I mean, there's a ton of pent up demand out there. And I think right now with the way that this recovery has been and what's been driving it, I'm not looking at more of an inflationary, but more of a reflationary environment. That's what we are seeing. That's what we're believing. As a matter of fact, I think there's more risk of deflation going into 21 rather than inflation. Um, but I will say one of the biggest macro components that we're going to watch is policy. You're going to have to watch policy going into 21 because right now there is an over-reliance going in for the foreseeable future on monetary tools. Putting Janet Yellen in her appointment as Treasury Secretary was positive in the sense that it's symbolic that the policymakers are going to be slow to do whatever, to move away from whatever it takes kind of efforts to normalize. Um, but I think going into 21, um, I think you're going to see more of a reflationary trade uh, rather than looking at inflation uh, and that risk coming up. Uh, I think the bigger risk is going to be deflation in 21. And so 
that's what we're keeping on. And that's kind of our, our thought process at this juncture. All right. Thank you. And I believe we have a poll question coming up. Here we go. All right, so to the audience, um, we'll take a quick 30 second break just to get this polling in. And of course you can see the question, given what we've seen in 2020, what is your outlook for equities in 2021? All right, such a great question considering what, you know, oh, bullish, look at that. Um, you know, thinking January 1st, 2020, right? Nobody would have expected what 2020 has brought along. So it's always interesting to see these questions, especially um, in, in today's environment. So let's, let's move along with the webinar here. Um, Joe, and I'll, I'll start with you. As the vaccine-led um, restart accelerates and central banks limit the rise of nominal year, yields, what market instruments will you employ to capture a pro-risk stance? Well, you know, the biggest thing is, is we're, we're going to start looking at the strategies we deploy and, and, and look at the kind of the payout ratios on those. Uh, as James was saying, you know, they, they kind of time option positions. And so we're really going to be looking at what is going to be the most optimal strategic approach based on the volatility regime we're in and, 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 and where we're at in the recovery and as well as the flattening the, the pandemic. Um, at this juncture, going into 21, we're going to be looking for continued upside. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, potentially laying out a little bit more upside long calls. We're a little bit heavier than we have been in the past uh, to the upside in the S&Ps and the NASDAQ. Um, and we're also looking into layering in put spreads going into the first quarter. We still believe that there's quite a bit of volatility in 21. Um, even though you've seen uh, volatility both in the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 pull back, we're seeing an optimal opportunity to layer in some put spreads at some really nice levels going into year end and into first quarter of next year. So that's how we're positioning staying still a little bit heavier on the downside as far as protection, uh, but allowing for upside runway uh, with the uh, calls coming off and being much more expensive. We're looking to layer in some long exposure there. All right, and James, you always have a, an interesting perspective on this. <clears throat> right, and so I have a, a bearish mindset uh, until I don't, and I'll stop having that bearish mindset. When we get a normal pause uh, and decline from a bull market, if COVID never happened, uh, if the pandemic never happened, we were looking at the longest and strongest bull market in history, some 144 months. Uh, nothing comes close post-World War II, roaring 90s. The market had gone up since March 2009, almost unabated. We had one negative ISM print in 2018 that gave us a test and a taste of a correction, but the bull market needed to be interrupted. And COVID's interruption created an artificial panic and a swift decline, 30 35%. But then the rally after, the concept of a recovery from a recession inside of 90 days. I mean, you can't even feel the baseball team in 90 days in Little League. Think about it. In order for economy to recover that fast, it would imply that the shock was a false alarm, right? And then there was a quick response. The response from the Fed was to protect us from going off the cliff. And the response triggered a complacency uh, that this market has run up even higher than before COVID. And so to put this in perspective, historically, we're at all time highs in terms of valuations. If you look at the US equity market cap, it represents 209% of GDP. And the PE ratios across all indexes, the NASDAQ, the Russell, the S&P, they continue to set all time highs. And the only other precedents close to where we are with GDP to PE ratios to profits are just before the 1929 crash and just before the 2001 crash and people don't change. Obviously there was no Facebook and Amazon and Netflix and Google and all the other wonderful names in 1929, but there were people and there was greed and there was fear. We believe that this market has to come back down uh, to reality relative to valuations, relative to the risk in the market and then continue on upward. And so our bias and our focus is to really capture that down move uh, when it comes, we think there's a reckoning. If you look at November, if you look at the Russell 2000, 
I've got computers on my side. I can't find a 30 day period on small caps that's run 23.9%. I can't find one in history. And so there isn't that much good news in the market to justify that. We are really positioned for a correction and maybe even worse. This isn't a negative outlook of our economy. It's not a negative outlook of our ability to get through COVID, um, but it's our focus on the technical and fundamental factors that have always driven markets. And so that's what we're really looking forward to. And we're doing it with index put options uh, and short-term volatility instruments. There are a few different ETFs that allow you to capture a uh, spike in volatility um, that are priced extremely well, priced below their pre-COVID levels, hitting 52-week lows, um, and then have explosive upstride, three, four, five, six, seven X upside on the ETF itself. And so those in the money call options provide um, you know, generational returns. And then the simple plain vanilla way is to buy put options on the indexes, the Russell 2000, the NASDAQ 100, the S&P 500. You cover all sectors with those. Um, and those exposures aren't expensive. And so you've, you've got a portfolio that's been rocking and rolling. You don't have to move to cash. You can take 10 to 15% and buy uh, a couple strikes out put option on those indexes. And you know if this scenario happens where the market comes down dramatically, you protect most of your games. And if I'm wrong and the market continues to go higher, you kind of offset the losses on that put options with games in your long portfolio. And so that's where our bias and our focus is right now. And Paul, I see you shaking your head in agreement to, to James's point. Yeah, I think uh, from our perspective, uh, we certainly don't try to time the market. Uh, our goal is to help our uh, clients, mostly advisors, uh, particularly in the RA channel. And their biggest struggle right now is how to do asset allocation in terms of, for example, the 60-40 portfolio, when so much of that 40% in bonds uh, certainly feels like dead money, right? Even if rates were to go slightly lower, you just don't have a lot of room. And so the power of bonds to provide diversification and mitigation going forward um, certainly feels a lot worse uh, going into sort of uh, today's market than it did earlier this year when yields were a lot higher. And so I think the interesting part and really the topic of this uh, webinar is how to use options. And, and we think, uh, again, using options as direct hedges when, uh, when correlation-based hedges are struggling or are likely to struggle going forward is a really, really interesting um, uh, alternative. And so what does that mean? Well, if you can't rely on bonds, if you can't rely on factor-based strategies like min-vol, low-vol type stuff that failed back in March, um, can you at least think about direct hedges, again, like puts, just like James was talking about, can you incorporate puts, which are guaranteed to be anti-correlated to equity returns as a way to think about diversification and risk mitigation? Um, and, and I think it's a great time for it. Certainly vols have come uh, implied vols have come a lot down since March and April timeframe. They're looking much closer to historical averages. Everyone's focused on the upside return now, and including our polls, we're seeing a lot of bulls in the marketplace. And so a very reasonable way to get downside protection is through options. You know exactly what you could lose. You, you put up premium, you size your sort of downside hedge, and it's, it's a way to manage your downside while still continuing to ride the upside exposure until we have that turn in the market. And so I think our strategies that incorporate out of the money puts are exactly that type of solution. And Paul, we've spoken about the risks associated in the market. What transformative shifts have you identified due to the pandemic and how do you plan to ex increase exposure to those sectors benefiting from the shift? Uh, no stranger, and certainly, you know, NASDAQ's been a beneficiary. I think there is certainly an embracing of technology, um, information technology, as well as other sectors that um, are being permanently changed by technology. It's completely a different scale game. Data matters a lot more, and data tends to be best utilized by large organizations, and, and you're seeing that, and you're seeing um, certainly even small cap, right, public companies, broadly speaking, are still large companies, right? Uh, relative to the vast majority of companies in, in the US that are privately owned and very, very small. And so all public equities have benefited from the shift to scale, the shift to uh, data, shift of technology. And I think public equities remain a very, very uh, 
you know, big beneficiary of this trend towards data and technology, um, whether it's mega caps, mid caps, or small caps, any company that makes ready use of the available toolkit today, um, I think it's a permanent advantage for, again, those that can tap into technology and frankly tap into financial markets to get funding. Yeah, Joe, we'll go over to you. It seems like data digitization, that really is, is the key, apparently. Yeah, no, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, technology and U.S. technology alone has been the driver. It's the poster child of this move. But I think, you know, what we have to be careful of is, and I think, you know, James has been talking about this as well since his bearish stance. You know, we look at the world and going into 21, I think some of the cyclical plays uh, are going to be something that we have to keep an eye on outside of technology. I think technology has played its role in the move that we've had. But if we get um, this pent up demand and renewed spending and it shifts in a positive manner um, with the combination of negative interest rates for the foreseeable future, um, I think at this juncture, you're seeing a catalyst going into 21 where you could see some cyclical names start to move, even though we might see some pressure on more of the traditional uh, larger, as we have discussed, FANGs and uh, Microsoft type of names that have been moving to the upside. So uh, again, while I think that trend has now been moved forward where we would have been in five years, I think we're there now and we're going to start building off of that. So you've seen that quote unquote paradigm shift come into play in six months rather than three to five years. Um, but I think there's a lot of catch up. You know, we, we primarily use S&P 500 names uh, in, in, in our fund you know, there's 495 names that need to catch up to this rally. Okay. And so at the end of the day, and it's the same thing with the NASDAQ, you know, if you look at the 100, there's over 90 names that need to start catching up with this rally. And so at the end of the day, if we can get the rest of those names in 21 to move up 10 or 20%, right. Even if we start to get a five or 10% pullback in some of the larger names that have been pulling this up, we're okay with next year. We're feeling good about what our targets are to the upside and as Paul said, you know, it's important. We always have a guardrail on 40% long put protection at all times because we're not going to time this market as both the other panelists have said. Timing is very difficult to do. Um, you look at it opportunistically, but always have a process and a guardrail in because if you do that, then you don't have to time the markets. Then you're positioning advantageously uh, so that you're driving the best risk adjusted returns. Right. And James, before we get to our second poll question, I'd like to ask the same of you in terms of your strategy. As you mentioned before, you're expecting a pullback, but are there any sectors that you'd be looking to get exposure to? Heck yeah. You know, we've seen, uh, as everyone said, technology has rushed in and McKinsey has said that we saw 10 years of e-commerce acceleration packed into three months of exponential growth. And think about that. 10 years of growth uh, achieved in three months. That is the big thing here. Move everything online, you know, and we've identified a basket of assets in certain areas. Uh, we think we're going to benefit from the online movement and, you know, e-commerce and online communications are still the thing in the beginning of our careers as the internet became more available through uh, broadband and, 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 and such, it's still being tapped. And what we're looking at ahead uh, is the extension of technology through 5G um, through communications and through online. Uh, I like digital visualization. There is a company that I love, Tableau. Uh, uh, Salesforce bought them out. If you think about digital visualization and advertising, um, we have our own brand preferences. If you could move every brand uh, into the face and the view of the people that want it in their entertainment consumption, uh, you've got a $600 billion of uh, revenues that are going to be bounced around. And we're really excited to see how uh, uh, digital visualization um, and the digitization of advertising across this new 5G networks are going to play out. Uh, we also like the green energy thing, you know, the, this generation coming up and taking over the world. Uh, they're more socially conscious than we've been in the past. And, you know, 5G and green energy are also part of China's five-year plan. Uh, and China five-year plans, when they're announced, you look at those industries and over the next five years, you see double-digit growth in employment, double-digit growth and investment, double digit growth and market share uh, acceleration. And so we really wanna take advantage of this catalyst, which was COVID of accelerating the online phenomena, both through uh, artificial intelligence and digital visualization. And then obviously we wanna make the world safer for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren 
um, there are ways to monetize that. And so that's where I think the transform transformative shifts are going. Um, and that's where we want to be long. You know, we want to be long in these areas. As always with growth investing, we want to be long in innovation, disruptive technologies. And so that's where we see there's going to be upside after the pullback. And obviously, you know, the market's not going to go down forever. It's going to come down and then it's going to go right back up. And we want to own those things that are going to go up faster. I would agree with you. This is not going away, this virtual experience. I would agree with you for sure. All right, let's pull up our second poll question here. Do you anticipate upgrading your exposure to risk assets through external investment structures or direct single stock investments? That's a great question. Good job, event producers. <laughs> this is a good question. Marketing team. Yeah, that is an awesome question. That sets us well for our next one too. Look at that. Half and half. Wow. wow. Call them DIYers? DIYers? Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Hmm. All right. With that, um, James, let's open this back up with you. Uh, with the noticeable demand for options within the retail community, and this was very interesting to watch in 2020, how can your firm help new players in the options market meet their investment needs? I think I have to be honest with you. This is a dangerous space to play in. It's, uh, options contracts are one of the most dangerous uh, securities out there, uh, <clears throat> get an expert to do it. To the poll question that you just saw, um, use someone's expertise to your benefit and look at Paul's funds, QQC and QQD. You can be in a portfolio and gain exposure where you need to get it. And just in case things don't work out, you're protected. And rather you sitting there and calculating betas and calculating deltas and calculating thetas and gammas, uh, and rows and trying to determine which strike price and which expiration date and what the delta is and all that, hire an expert. You should allocate to funds that have a specialization in this asset class. And if I can be helpful, it would be to advise allocators and investment advisors to find experts who manage options-based strategies within funds and then put those funds in your portfolio strategically so you can focus on aligning the balancing of that portfolio with your clients' goals as they need um, and not trying to wrangle all of the technical details and shifts and changes in these securities. And so the best way to play an option strategy is to find an options specialist uh, here conveniently wrapped in a package like what Paul's doing uh, and put those portfolios, uh, excuse me, put those funds in your portfolios so that the portfolios behave in the way uh, that options can benefit them. Well, the poll answers were, were a bit surprising to me. And Paul, with that. Uh, it's interesting. And I, Look, it's, in one sense, it's great, right? We have an entire generation, right? The millennials and increasingly Gen Z now um, coming into the market and embracing investing, mostly in companies they know, right? The joke is a new 60-40 portfolio is 60% Tesla, 40% Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> but but that's a good thing. It's a good thing in that we're getting um that's a heck of a interest. portfolio. It, that's been a phenomenal <laughs> portfolio. I, I, I should have done I wasn't that. In it. I should have done that too. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, look, that's a great thing to have interest in the market. Uh, great thing to remove a lot of the stigma. Yes, it's risky in one sense. Yes, it's, you know, you're sort of failing in terms of things like concentration versus diversification. However, you're getting, you know, an, an entire generation of, of people really excited and and actively participating in the market. And for the most part, they're, they're proving the experts wrong, right? They're, they're making a lot more money than sort of a broad, broadly speaking hedge fund indexes and things like that. So it's really interesting time. Um, I think options are powerful. We, again, look more at the index side, the broader portfolio side, but the interest in options means the liquidity of all options, the ability for people to trade and provide both sides of that bet um, and embracing of the unique properties of options are all exciting. Uh, we saw during sort of the March, April period, oil futures go minus 40, right? Um, minus 38. Uh, that's a very, very scary outcome that you would never see if you're long options. The fact that you could buy an option know exactly what risk you have and have quote unquote uh, non-recourse leverage. It's a really uh, better way for a lot of sort of, uh, you know, retail certainly investors to get leverage, um, even relative to things like margin debt, which can force selling when, uh, you know, so path dependency becomes a bigger problem. So we welcome the interest, we welcome the 
sort of generational um, use of options. I agree with James and, and Joe and in, in sort of, uh, I think the more professional use is, is better long-term, but, you know, basically uh, embrace interest. Yeah, I would agree with you there. And Joe, I, I would imagine trying to tactically do this, especially if, if, you're, if you're newer at, at this, um, it could be, it also be a bit expensive to try and replicate what professional managers are doing as well. Um, you know, here, I'll, I'll lay out a couple of things um, just to kind of lay out, because I've been doing this for 26 years. I did a reverse commute. I started as a market maker on the floor, helped build one of the largest online uh, options brokerage companies, Options Express, and then transitioned into an RIA and working now in a 40X space using overlay strategies. The one thing that I will say about options, one is it's the fastest growing industry as far as any financial product out there right now, and it will continue to grow. Two is, is that individuals through study have now understood that what you could do with products in the past, you can now use option strategy. And number three is as exchanges like the NASDAQ and other ones basically start to expand their offerings as far as what you can do both as an individual and an institution. Let's just say this, individual investors have been able to use options more effectively than institutions over the last decade. In the last three years, I have seen pension funds, I have seen RIAs and advisors now able to incorporate options directly as well as through utilization of funds. And I think it's a comfort level, Jill. I think that when an advisor is looking at this, the, the, the price compression has come down so much that whether they're doing it as an individual or using an, a manager, I'm doing a 40 act fund and we're charging under hundred basis points for an option based strategy approach, right? Paul's using an ETF structure that probably has a very low cost basis and James equally, right? We're, it's competitive, pricing has come down. I think it's first and foremost, educating yourself and then basically looking and saying, what's gonna fit my risk tolerances, my objectives for my clients or what I'm comfortable doing, my knowledge base. And then at the end of the day, if you have to pay 75 basis points or 90 points for working with a fund or an ETF or working with a direct manager, then do it. If you want to do cover calls and collars and protective puts, and you look at the 60 cents a contract that you're going to be doing that for a client, and that basically comes into a couple basis points, then do it. It's just about getting yourself educated and get on this train. Because if you don't get on this train, and I think Paul and James would, would agree with me, you're going to miss out on an opportunity because bonds are going to be at low interest rates for a long time. As Paul was saying, you're not getting that diversification. And equities are going to be a challenge as far as valuation, as James has said, but options are liquid, they're fairly priced, the spreads are tight, there's not a lot of barriers of entry here. So, uh, so sorry about getting long winded on this one, but I think it's important to understand that whether you do it individually or as a fund, I think right now the fee compression is to a point where you can make a great choice either way. All right, Joe, and I'm going to start with you for our last question before we get into audience Q&A and our final poll question. Um, and we touched upon this earlier. How do you intend to trade tactically through near-term market volatility while maintaining your long-term strategic conviction? If you could just wrap up with our high-level overview here. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest thing is, is that you have to understand the vol regime you are in in the business cycle. Once you understand that, you start to deploy the appropriate strategies to drive your risk-adjusted return. We always want to look up in the right as far as our hedged equity uh, strategy approach, right? Where we always have that guardrail protection on at all time, 40% minimum in our case. But we're always looking to capture as much upside. So uh, if our average capture ratio is between 40 and 60%. So that's how we tactically do that. But we look at the vol regime. If vol is high, we're selling further out of the money calls. If vol is low, we might be selling closer to in the money calls or at the money calls, but we're buying out of the money calls to basically keep that runway. And the same thing with puts and put spreads. We're looking at the vol regime, we're looking at the cycle, and we're deploying the right strategies. And most importantly, Jill, finally, a final point is, is we actively manage those. We harvest them when we can. Markets go down, we harvest the long puts, we harvest the short calls. We buy those back, sell those puts out, and vice versa. Active management is the key thing. That's what 21 is going to be all about is active management and uh, 
you know, that's our, how we look at it. And James, if you could wrap with your tactical and longer term strategic strategy. Well, you know, first I want to say, you know, we're pretty good at this. I think we're the largest trader of index options on, on the exchanges, largest trader of, in, of NASDAQ options. Uh, you know, we just crossed $5 billion in trades that we've done exclusively on index options. And so this is our domain of expertise and our approach to it is very focused. We like high delta contracts, meaning if the market moves a point, we want to earn as close to a point as possible. So we know what our cost and our benefit is. We understand that markets change and shift direction with new information. And so you've really got to monitor the inputs of the market that you're trading with options and look at the option as just a big sledgehammer to monetize a thesis. We don't necessarily have to get into all the technical details of the option, but our directionality has to be important. As Paul keeps pointing out, having a guardrail, our guardrail is that we go deep in the money. Uh, in order to get a nine delta or a 9.5 delta, a 0.95 delta, you gotta be deep in the money. We like to be deep in the money. We like to be several strikes out. Uh, we like to be several uh, 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 months out in terms of our expiration. Uh, and then we wanna be uh, where the moment of truth happens with the right index. And if your thesis on a directional change in uh, uh, investment is tech focused, it's going to be NASDAQ. If it's not tech focused, it's financial focused, healthcare focused, it's going to be Russell. If it's broader, uh, you want to be S&P. And so you want to pick the right index, pick the right time, pick the right strike. Uh, and then obviously you want to make sure that your risk reward uh, is justified. And that's how we approach it. And what we're doing here and preparing for 2021 uh, is taking an approach where we don't necessarily have to put capital in equities. We can put capital in options and monetize a thesis. When we look at what happened in 2020, uh, I think Paul commented, you know, the other 495 companies need to catch up. The other 95 companies need to catch up. When we're looking at a handful of companies driving an entire market, uh, we also want to look at the downside risk, what happens with those companies. And so we're monitoring all the constituents uh, the big market cap constituents within an index to see how they get bullied around. All right, Paul, last word. Sure. So we uh, are not tactical at all. Uh, certainly leave that to the experts in, in sort of being able to time or uh, take advantage of uh, near-term opportunities. Our view is basically add flood insurance, right? Catastrophic insurance, buy insurance. It tends to be underpriced, actually. So it's, it's a strange insurance market if you think of... Uh, out of the money puts and increasing out of the money calls. It's often underpriced because you have more people selling insurance than buying insurance. Um, and, and so from our perspective, it's important to understand if you don't have the skill to be tactical, stay invested, but really think about what could happen, right? The guardrails, the flood insurance, how do you sort of stay in the investment game? Because you know, this is retirements and sort of financial well-being we're talking about here. And so the, the, the cost of essentially a catastrophe, catastrophe on your uh, retirement portfolio, you can't redo that, right? So having that sort of downside protection and taking advantage of the power and increasing liquidity of options is great. And, and being able to go all the way from super low delta out of the money puts all the way up to near the money at the money, um, all of those things are really what makes options so powerful and so uh, increasingly embraced. So we're excited about it. All right, awesome. Thanks guys. We're gonna throw up our last poll question and then we have a few Q and A from the audience to get through. I just wanna remind the audience if you have additional questions for our panelists, you can include it in the Q and A um, function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So do you think COVID-19 has permanently altered the economy? I would say certain sectors of it. Oops. Seems to be our most definitive poll results of the afternoon, interesting. All right. Let's get into our Q&A, James. I'm going to start with you because I know you talk about VolQ um, all the time. And um, of course, we're excited about that at NASDAQ. So with the first question, um, if you could give a high level overview of what VolQ is uh, and how traders can, can use it, um, that would be awesome. And the question to follow up in the past one to two months, how much did the VolQ futures suffer price-wise? I think with, with Vol coming in a bit is probably what they're referring to. Okay, so I love VolQ. Let me say that out front. It's like a third grade Valentine's Day. I gave Pearl some candy and she smiled and it's 
changed my life. You know, it's one of those things where uh, this is a moment where we can take advantage uh, of volatility in a way that is so focused. Uh, the VIX has provided us with somewhat of a barometer of sentiment for a very broad index. The S&P 500 has all the sectors in it. It's got a little bit of bullying from tech, uh, but that can be offset like was mentioned about the energy collapse earlier this year. That threw things around. What I love about VolQ as a manager seeking growth and protection and with a, a focus on uh, generating outsized returns is I can target protection against volatility and I can target capturing profits from volatility in the area that is hottest. Tech is what has been driving this market. I think we attributed something like 85% of the gains year to date about a month ago in the S&P to a handful of companies. And you know it, those handful of companies were the NASDAQ 100 bullies. And those companies are also where the risk is. If the volatility spikes in the S&P 500, it's going to spike predominantly from tech. So if we want to capture that spike in volatility, we want to concentrate on where it's coming from. And what VolQ does is it takes the broad-based approach uh, at capturing volatility and focuses it where the action is. So obviously VolQ is going to price the volatility on the NASDAQ 100. And the NASDAQ 100 is an index that has no financial firms in it. It's an index that holds all of the monsters in tech, all of the monsters in healthcare, all of the monsters that have driven this market up uh, to all time highs. And when that stops, VolQ can be a hedge for a portfolio. If you don't wanna sell your Apple stock, and we see it all the time, we open a portfolio and the portfolio is up 100% over the last three years. And you look in it and you attribute almost 90% of that to Apple. In a taxable account, they don't wanna sell that thing. How do you protect that? You buy Vol Q. With 10% of your portfolio, you can offset most of the risk in that. It's just a tool with so much focus. The technical aspects of Vol Q make it superior to the VIX because it prices the near term options contract, the at the money contracts on volatility. And what we're going to see with Vol Q uh, as we go, and you know, we have a mutual fund now that that mutual fund is going to be focusing on uh, risk hedging for portfolios. We're going to buy a ton of VolQ in it because when the market comes off, it's likely to come off most dramatically in tech. And we can leverage, like we've been talking about with options, we can leverage capital by putting a little bit in something that has the opportunity to really explode. Um, and so it's just an amazing, amazing tool um, to protect a portfolio that's run up based on tech uh, and or to generate outsized returns. And here's a great time to do it because tech is hitting all time highs. I've uh, been talking with you guys, so I haven't seen the market today, but when I left my uh, trading station, uh, we were touching all time highs. And so we should get VolQ here at a great discount relative to the macro picture. And to follow up on that, um, they're asking, do VolQ futures suffer monthly shrinkage like VIX futures? So we have to see, you know, we have a very short history here. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been trading uh, about six weeks uh, and we have to see how this thing behaves. Uh, we want to think about time decay. We want to think about contango. We want to think about uh, rolling futures. We want to think about all these things, but in the broadest sense of how we want to participate in this, this is something, and I think Paul said it many times uh, about having insurance and as financial professionals, we have to distinguish insurance from investment products, but the principle is there. Just in case things don't go according to plan, uh, VolQ is going to explosively rise if there's an explosive fall uh, in tech. And so we want to really not get uh, uh, too caught up in the uh, narrow details of, of, of how it tracks so early on. Here with the market being at all-time highs, I think that you know we really focus on uh, that insurance concept. Got it. And, and for the benefit of the audience, VolQ Futures launched on CME on October 5th. So to James's point, it, there's, you know, we need to get a little bit more history there to understand the price movement in the futures. Um, and, and Paul, we have another question on VolQ asking, is, it, is VolQ recommended even if your portfolio isn't tech heavy? So we don't really use vol, uh, either VIX or VolQ as sort of an investment tool. We'll use it as a sentiment uh, sort of measurement, right? So it's another data point that we could look at to see uh, sort of the cost of insurance, if you will, in the sense of what is the cost of putting on option trades. 
Um, it's also a really uh, sort of a really interesting data point when some of your old sort of uh, indicators that told you recession risk and things like that, like the yield curve, right, are now so manipulated that sort of the data you get back is less reliable. And so I think uh, VIX and VOLQ as market sentiment, i.e. When, it, when it's higher, you have much more fear in the market. When it's lower, you have much less fear. But also it's a very uh, strong data point that measures liquidity in the market. Um, when, when there's a very, very liquid market, uh, it's very correlated with the lower VIX or presumably Vol, Vol, Vol Q, uh score uh, measurements. So we look at that for both of those inputs. And we're not, as at least a firm, we're not trying to time you know, the cost of insurance. We have a strategic view of it. We take what the market gives, but it will provide a lot of feedback for the much more tactical, much more uh, sort of trade-oriented folk like uh, James and Joe. Joe, when we talk about this concept of hedging, what's your go-to product? Are you doing this more with options, more with futures? Is there a specific product that um, is most appropriate for, for your style of management? Yeah, so in our uh, hedged equity product, uh, we have about 11 billion, 11 and a half billion. We're using primarily SPX options. Uh, that's our notional overlay uh, on an S&P 500. We've looked at potentially using NASDAQ options going uh, also forward into 21. Um, we have used futures overnight. That's where we have the ability to go in overnight when we see something um, that's happening uh, overnight, we can use the futures markets. Um, but at the end of the day, we're primarily using uh, index options, cash settled index options for two reasons. One, they're extremely liquid and two, they're 1256. So that means that they have favorable tax treatment, 60% uh, long-term, 40% short-term. That's very important when you're thinking about that, when you're thinking about fees and so forth. Um, but yeah, that's why we like to look at uh, NASDAQ and SPX as the primary uh, notional overlays. All right, sounds good. So gentlemen, we have about five minutes to go here. If you can each take about a minute, minute and a half with your final remarks. Paul, we'll start with you. James and Joe, will have you close it out. Sure, it's uh, important given, again, the meltup we're seeing and all this sort of unprecedented stimulus to stay invested in the market. But it's also important to understand that this is not your sort of normal everyday market and that by almost any measure, we're at the max sort of two, three standard deviations and valuations, which implies we're at, you know, very, very significantly high risk of a drawdown eventually. And so I think as long as you sort of think about both the opportunity, but the cost of not having risk mitigation, options become a really interesting way to hedge your downside relative to more traditional correlation-based hedges. And uh, we'd love to uh, help advisors and investors think through some of those challenges. And we have some ETFs that provide that sort of direct hedging today. All right, QQC and QQD. All right, James. To echo the point of where we are in the market and wherever your money is right now, um, understand this market looks just like it did and worse uh, the days before the 1929 crash, the days before the 2001 crash. And so let's be cautious. If the market continues to go higher, great. If it doesn't, um, the downside risk is tremendous. And so have a plan and then have a tool to do it. And that tool may be a fund, in the fund, a fund, a fund manager, uh, or uh, an options contract. And like we've said, it doesn't have to be complex. Let's demystify this uh, security. You know, a single put contract on uh, uh, an index such as the NASDAQ 100, a single put contract, uh, if this market crashes and if the market uh, stays uh, in a distressed state, that single put option might cost five, six percent of your portfolio, uh, but it'll double or triple. And so you can offset a lot of risk uh, by just understanding that those tools are there and uh, find a professional, find an expert, uh, such as the folks on this panel, um, to show you how to do that. Yeah, and I, I couldn't reiterate James's comments and Paul's comments anymore. You want to continuously search for a hedge that's going to give you as much downside protection as possible, uh, but you don't want to give up. Uh, you want to give up as little upside participation uh, as possible when a market rallies, and and that's where, as James said and Paul, whether it's through an ETF structure, whether it's utilizing a fund manager or incorporating option strategies as a practitioner. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is take the opportunity 
to utilize these really liquid products, take the opportunity to learn about them and take advantage, that'll allow you to take advantage of opportunities when the market presents them, right? And so that you're gonna be advantageously positioned for as many outcomes as possible. Um, and I think that's really the opportunity that after today's discussion, reaching out to any one of us or any other manager for that manager uh, manner uh, could really be beneficial for your practice going forward. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I believe a replay will be sent out to everyone who signed up for the webinar. And this way you'll have um, ways to connect with us in case you have any additional questions. So on behalf of myself, our panel and NASDAQ, we wish everyone a happy holiday and happy new year. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.